Hey folks, Pete here from Tyrish Times. Today I'm going to tell you the story of a Thai man who saved the lives of thousands of Allied POWs during World War II, held by the Japanese Imperial Army. This story takes place in Kanchanaburi, Thailand, and right now I'm in Kanchanaburi War Cemetery, where 5,000 British Commonwealth troops lie and 1,900 Dutch troops lie. And to tell this story today, we're gonna to go to a couple of different locations where it all played out. So stick with me and let's begin. So for a lot of today's story, folks, I'm gonna stay behind the camera because I wanna give you a sense of what I'm looking at. Every one of these graves lies a man who had dreams, ambitions, family all taken away from him very very sad anyway let's give you the backdrop on this story and we do that by starting with Japan's role in World War II so by the late 1930s Japan's empire had grown with each victory so too did her appetite for more. Japan set its sights on conquering Southeast Asia to obtain vital resources. But Japan's biggest obstacle to do this would be the British bastion on the tip of Malaya, Singapore. The Japanese invaded Malaya and Singapore the British army surrendered and a month later the Dutch East Indies was defeated. The Imperial Japanese army now held 120,000 men. The Japanese realized that they could use these Australian, British, Canadian and Dutch prisoners of war to build a railway from Siam, Thailand, to Burma, now Myanmar, in preparation for an invasion of India. These POWs now became slave laborers and began construction on what was to become known as the Death Railway. Some 12,000 prisoners of war and 30,000 Asian workers died a terrible death. And that's what you're looking at right here, folks the result of this death railway. But like every horror story, or every crisis, there's always a hero. That's what they say, isn't it? Crises make heroes. And there are many heroes in this story, I just picked one. It's a story that is not well told or not known. And let's get into this man's story. So our hero today, his name is Boonpong Siri Wedjapan. And he was born in 1906 in Kanchanaburi, he was the son of a doctor. Instead of following in his father's footsteps and becoming a doctor, Boonpong decided he liked the hustle and bustle of commerce and set up business as a retail merchant in a shop house called Boonpong and Brothers. And this brought him into contact with the Japanese. Because right now I'm in Kanchanaburi city. And back in the 40s, this would have been much smaller than it is today. But it would have been a big town. And the Japanese would have been coming in here, getting supplies. But they would have been fairly active in this town. And that's what Boom Pong was doing. He was selling them supplies. He got the contract to supply the camps with food and groceries. And by getting this contract, that brought Boon Pong face to face with the inhumane cruelty that the Japanese soldiers were inflicting on the prisoners of war. Boon Pong witnessed men being tortured, starved, severely beaten, men plagued with malaria and all sorts of tropical diseases. 
Men who were just bare bones. Walking skeletons. The daily food ration was just a thousand calories. Which was nowhere near enough for the demands of hard physical labour. Boom Pong decided that he was not going to complacently stand by and ignore what was happening. He saw that the POWs were in desperate need of food and medicine. So he went to Bangkok and made a contact with a clandestine organisation that helped the POWs who used the code name V. Now I'm assuming V stands V for victory, the famous Winston Churchill sign when he put his two fingers up. This organization needed someone to sneak medicine, food, into the POW camps to those men to keep them alive. And Boom Pong was the perfect man for the job. So we're talking about building a railway from Kanchanaburi into Myanmar, through jungle, dense forest, through mountains, the worst terrain possible, okay? And the Japanese were not giving anyone any medicine, or barely any food. So you had Caucasian men, who are not used to the tropical climate, working, working in the jungles with no heavy machinery, hands, their bloody hands. These guys were using little shovels and picks, hacking through mountains. Sometimes they used dynamite, but often they didn't have it. Anyway, Boon Pong. He would arrive at one of these camps. Often he brought his daughter, and he used her as a decoy. Apparently she was very beautiful, and she attracted the guards' attention. So as his daughter was chatting to the guards, Boon Pong would go into the camp, make contact with the Allied officer, and quickly smuggle him some medicine. And this medicine kept thousands of people alive. Because they weren't getting any medicine. Like I said, can you imagine the conditions that these men were working in? Walking skeletons, barely getting any food. They needed all the help they can get. And this little Thai man who is described as being, you know, short, kind of a chubby, pudgy guy. He look, looks like a bit of a nerd. He's rolling into the camp and he's giving people medicine. And Boom Pong was a clever, clever guy. He knew the art of, I suppose, bribery. Because often he would bribe the guards. He figured out that there was a ranking order to the Japanese camps. So you had the Japanese guards, and then under them you had Korean conscripts. Well, the Japanese hated the Koreans and gave them a lot of flack. They beat the Koreans, and in turn the Korean guards beat the POWs. So Boon Pong figured it all out, and he knew the right people to bribe. And if he threw a little bit of money here and there, some of these guards would, would turn their heads away, especially the Korean guards. And Boom Pong was no fool. He knew that if he got caught, he'd be beheaded. And so too might his family. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the story, Boon Pong was a retail merchant. And he had a shop here in Kanchanaburi. And that's where we're going next. Because this shop in Kanchanaburi was like a hangout for the Japanese. Boon Pong played both sides, you know. He was friendly to the Japanese when he needed to be. The Japanese trusted him. And then the POWs trusted Boom Pong. He was like a double agent. So we'll continue our story at Boom Pong's house. So folks, right now I'm standing outside Boon Pong and Brothers. And it's in the old town of Kanchanaburi. And back in the World War II uh, era, this place was a beehive of activity. As I mentioned earlier, Boom Pong had the contract to supply food to the camps. So the Japanese soldiers would come here and they used to bring the POWs here as kind of slave laborers to carry things and it was here, right around here from the book that I read, somewhere here across the street, around this part, there were a group of POWs standing to attention and one man fainted 
he wasn't able to stand up anymore and he was kicked to death by a Japanese soldier and Boon Pong's uh, daughter witnessed that and that was the moment that she really turned against the Japanese. Really fascinating stuff. You can see that he was obviously a prosperous man. It's a very big house here in the old town of Kanchanaburi. And believe it or not, we just went inside and we just met Boon Pong's daughter-in-law, a very, very old lady now. And she just told us that Boon Pong would uh, sneak the, um, the medicine into the pomelo. He would stick it into the fruit and he would hide it in the, in the bam bamboo sticks. So when the Japanese soldiers looked, they wouldn't find it. You know, he hid it very well. That story about the POW standing to attention they were um, being punished for something. That's what I read. And they were made to stand up for 24 hours without sitting down. And one man fell to the ground and he was kicked to death. Now, the next place that we're gonna continue this story is not in this city. It's outside the city in the, in the jungle. Let's go. So by 1943, the tide of war was turning against Japan. They had lost control of the seas in Southeast Asia. US submarines now dominated. So that meant completion of this railway was of vital importance for the Japanese. So they set a crazy deadline and they had a, a, a thing called Speedo. That's what the Japanese used to call it. It means like work faster. They couldn't really speak English. So they said speed, speedo, speedo, speedo. And they really worked these men really, really hard. And what they did was they transported 19,000 more POWs here to Kanchanaburi and thousands more coolie laborers to work as fast as they possibly could under the worst conditions possible. And the place I'm standing at now is a very famous place in the construction of this railway. It's called Hellfire Pass. And you might think, interesting name, Hellfire Pass. Why is it called that? Well, let's go in and I'll explain more. This, my friends, is Hellfire Pass. And it's a huge rock cutting gouged out of a mountain by a group of Australians. It's 80 feet deep and 200 yards long. These men gouged this mountain out by hand and worked through the night. They used torches to light the mountain up at night. Their shadows on the rock face as they worked resembled a scene from hell. So you can imagine a group of men working at night. The Japanese were under serious pressure to finish this railway. And the shadows along the, the rock here as well as the Japanese shadows. A lot of, of the veterans said that they used to see the Japanese with big sticks and the shadow would be really tall because of the angle of the light from the fire. And that's why it's called Hellfire Pass. Okay, so we're looking at a broken compressor drill. And right here, there's a drill gone down into the rock and it's broken off. And that's how they did it. It was a two-man job. One would hold the drill, another would wield a hammer and bash it down into the rock, bash the drill into the rock. And then um, an engineer would come then and he would put dynamite in the hole and blow it up. And I'm trying to find, I saw it earlier, there we go, look. There's a, the mark of the drill bit. You can imagine a man Look how, look how long it is, about half a meter. You can imagine a man, two men bashing that down with some Japanese officer shouting at them. And I came across a quote from a Japanese officer, a high ranking Japanese officer. And he said, I don't care if they all die, so long as the railroad is finished. That'll give you an insight into how the Japanese thought. 
So the completion of this railway resulted in one death for every railroad tie that was laid. Some 12,000 POWs and 30,000 Asian workers died completing this railway. We're now in a camp where the men slept. These men. Not very luxurious. Here are the Japanese, looking very happy, standing on the, the banks of the river here. Now this is very interesting. Elephants were used extensively in Burma and Thailand during construction of the railway. Their main task was to haul logs from the jungle. At Kanyu, Australians were astonished to find themselves sharing the same narrow muddy track with six of these lumbering animals. When the Burmese drivers died of cholera, the elephants refused to perform heavy tasks which were taken over by the prisoners of war. These six elephants bathed in a small creek upstream at Kanyu camp so that by the time water reached the prisoners of war, it often resembled a thick soup. God. Now there's one more place I want to take you in this historical journey of World War II in Thailand. A hero's story. And that hero's story is going to be at the next destination. So let's go. Tamakan Bridge. It's a very famous feature of the Death Railway, this bridge is. And it was constructed by the POWs. And you might remember it from the movie, The Bridge Over the River Kwai. And the movie is all about the construction of this bridge. And I would just like to say the movie has a host of in inaccuracies. In the film, the bridge is made from wood. Uh, the film also depicts the POWs as having a strong fighting spirit marching defiantly to work on the bridge every day. However, this is not the case. During my research about this bridge, the POWs that actually built it saw the movie and they hated the movie. Some of them were furious about this movie. How could they make a movie that is totally inaccurate, they said. One of the veterans said, the movie depicts the POWs as really defiant, strong, marching men, marching every day to work on the bridge. And he said, it doesn't, that just wasn't the case. He said that we were walking skeletons. We didn't have any energy. It was on this bridge that the POWs heard the faint sound of rumbling bombs in the distance. And they knew the war was over. Or, not over, but drawing to an end. Or shall we say, not going too well for the Japanese. When rumors spread that there were two American bombs that devastated two Japanese cities, the prisoners had hopes for a rescue. So on the 15th of August, 1945, Boon Pong rode past on his bicycle. War finish, war finish, he shouted waving V signs in jubilation. After three and a half years in captivity, the POWs were finally free. The long-awaited moment finally came all along the length of the railway. Allied troops at last walked into the POW camps. The prisoners were free.
soap and hot water, a cup of coffee. The simple joys of being alive had returned. I cannot begin to tell you the feeling of hearing, the, hearing this voice, this English voice. How are you, mate? You, you know, I can't just talk about it. It's something indescribable. And then you begin to realize that you're a free man. You're free, you know? And these bastards, why not, have not been able to kill me off. It is a tremendous feeling, and that to feel that you can say no to anybody, you know, to anyone and anybody. And this, to me, you know, made it all worth. The war was over, but for Boon Pong, a different sort of battle was about to begin. A few weeks later, someone tried to assassinate him. He was shot in front of his house, the very house that I showed you yesterday. He was shot in front of his house three times. One of the bullets pierced his lung and he was in serious condition. And yesterday when I met his daughter-in-law, she told me that the Australians, Australian POWs, wanted to help him because he did such a good job for them. He saved so, so many of their lives. They wanted to help him. And what they did was, they, one of them went to Singapore to get blood. And they brought back blood from Singapore for Boon Pong. And he spent a year in hospital recovering. Now, nobody knows who shot him. His daughter-in-law says that it, it could have been Siri Thai, which was a Thai freedom fighting organization. And she thinks it might have been them because at the time they were putting pressure on Boon Pong to join their organization or assassinate the Japanese officers when they came to his shop. Uh, another theory about who shot him was um, could have been jealous uh, store owners because Boon Pong got the contract to um, supply the Japanese with food. So someone that was jealous. There's Neon. <laughs> So after the war, Boon Pong went to work in his retail business. He went back to work. The war was over. What's he going to do? He has to make a living. So he went back to being an entrepreneur, a businessman. But the war had not made him rich. He became short of cash, contacted the British and Australian governments. He said, is there any chance you can give me the money that I gave to the POWs. Uh, initially, the British and Australian governments refused. They refused to reimburse him for the money he advanced to the Allied prisoners. Boom Pong went back and forth with both governments for years to try and get some money back. He eventually received partial payment, but not enough to cover all his expenses. And then years after that, he entered the transportation business. Boon Pong bought a couple of buses, apparently they were old Japanese buses and Boon Pong, the entrepreneur that he is, saw an opening in the market. Bangkok had a very bad transportation system, Boon Pong had some old Japanese buses. So these Japanese buses were on the streets of Bangkok. But it didn't go well for Boon Pong and his company was in financial difficulty and he was facing bankruptcy. And it was only when three British ex-POWs found out about Boon Pong's plight. They wanted to help him. So these ex-POWs wrote a letter of appeal to all the ex-POWs asking for a contribution to help out a man who risked his life and did so much to help us. That was the um, official wording. They wanted to help him because he helped them. So eventually Boon Pong received 38,000 pounds, a huge sum back in the day. His business was saved. In later years, both Britain and Australian governments recognized Boon Pong's efforts during the war, and he was rewarded with an MBE for bravery. And in 1994, the Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating laid a wreath in Kanchanaburi War Cemetery and mentioned Boon Pong in his speech. He said that many POWs survived captivity because of the heroic deeds of Boon Pong. And in 1972, he met the Queen. When the Queen visited Thailand, Boon Pong met the Queen. 
on our boat. Had a big old dinner with the Queen of England. Our, our hero Boon Pong. The POWs returned to cemeteries in Thailand, Burma, and Hawaii to look for old friends, old mates. This year I went back, and I go to Kanchanaburi Cemetery, and I walk around those graves, and the tears stream down my face when I'm thinking of all my mates who are there. And when they play the last post, or the ode, there's not a true word there. They shall grow not old, as we that left grow old. Because you look at those graves and you picture them as they were then. <laughs>